It's yours, Jean. Hi, Barbara. Um, here's a little bit of history. Way back when we were grad students together at Cornell, I went off to UCSB and Barbara went off to IBM Almaden, where we've both been ever since. Um, every time Barbara's name comes up, I've been extremely impressed to hear what she's up to, both in terms of her scientific contributions and her contributions to science culture. It is my pleasure to introduce Barbara's living history. Take it away, Barbara. Oh, thank you, Jean, and thank you to everybody for inviting me. So let's see here, I'm going to share my screen. And then let's go into presenter mode. And uh, can people see it? Uh, yes, it's not in presenter mode yet. I'll click a second time. Now it's in presenter mode, yes? Yes. Yes. So um, I will go quickly over my, uh, my, my whole talk I would like to to, to, to slant is what have, what have been my influences over the years. And certainly my parents uh, were influences on me. My parents were both immigrants to the United States, the only ones from their respective countries. My father came from Liverpool, England, and he knew the Beatles. Um, he joined the Navy for World War II and he sailed around Southeast Asia. Then my mother comes from Far East Europe, which is now uh, part of Russia but was then uh, Prussia, and she spent her whole uh, childhood and young adulthood, uh, teenagehood, um, is a refugee uh, fleeing west uh, uh, in front of the advancing Russian army. Um, and the family on the German side is now just scattered across Germany. My mother left Germany as soon as she could in 45, got work in London as a pastry chef. How she got trained as a pastry chef is something that I... I remember asking her, but didn't get a good answer. Anyway, she was working in a top hotel as a pastry chef, and she always has made very excellent pastries, by the way. Um, <clears throat> she met my father, and uh, she went to the U.S. first, and my father followed, and they ended up in Indianapolis, Indiana, where their sponsor lived, and that's where I was born and grew up. So Indianapolis in the 1960s and 70s was... An odd time, there was still segregation in downtown Indianapolis as to who could use which bathrooms and which drinking fountains. And that made an enormous impact on me, the strangeness of all of that. Um, there was the Vietnam War going on. Um, also, in 1960, when I was born, um, it was only 15 years after World War II. And so there was a little bit of strange attitudes toward my German mother in the neighborhood as well. So um, it was it was a, an interesting and odd time. But uh, I went to a good high school. The, the local high school wasn't private, just public high school. And I got two years of physics and two years of chemistry. And while I was there, my chemistry teacher told me about a Saturday morning program taught by Professor Marshall Dixon. And Marshall said, why can't high school students learn quantum mechanics? And so he proceeded to teach. It was just one or two or three of us at a time. And he would teach us quantum mechanics, give us some problem sets to do. And I worked through this problem sets and course on quantum mechanics. And I thought, this is pretty cool. And so um, I'm very glad I met him. And then <clears throat> through that program and the people I met there, I found out about Harvard and how that could be a good place for me. And off I went. I mean, of course, it wasn't as simple as deciding to go to Harvard and then <laughs> they <laughs> welcome Barbara, come. But um, it was, it was, um, I'm very glad I went to Harvard. I liked it very much. I'd always loved math and sought out math puzzles throughout junior high school. In fact, I still do seek out difficult math problems. Um, and I decided to go into physics at Harvard because the math seemed to be a lot of doing proofs and I like applying math. Summers, I worked at Bell Labs, first in Indianapolis, um, but then Bell Labs headquarters in Murray Hill. And there I met a number of very excellent physicists, all of whom were extremely supportive of me uh, doing science. But in particular, I show a picture of Chandra Varma who was just really to make a very big impact on my life. 
I started working with him when I was an undergraduate. Um, I spent a year at University of Cambridge doing part three maths and meeting all my relatives in Europe. And then I went on to Cornell for a PhD. And um, I got the advisor that um, was recommended to be my charter. In fact, he said, work with John Wilkins if you can. And so indeed, I worked with John Wilkins at uh, Cornell, of course, afterwards, after I did my PhD, right after, in fact, he moved to Ohio, but at that point he was at Cornell. And my PhD was in strongly correlated electron solution of the two impurity condo problem by numerical renormalization group. Plus I found a new symmetry of lattices, condo lattice, which in fact, turned out to hold axial charge, I called it, which turned out to hold all lattice models, such as the Anderson model, Hubbard model, et cetera. So that was very exciting too, to find a new symmetry that people hadn't found before. Um, and then I went and did a postdoc at Harvard. And while I was at Harvard, uh, IBM went to my advisor and said, John, do you know of anybody of your students who knows magnetism and might like to work on applied problems in magnetic storage. And he said, why don't you talk to Barbara Jones? And so uh, IBM came calling and I interviewed there twice. And the second time I said, well, maybe I will move to California and work for them. And I have worked for IBM ever since. I've worked on a range of projects over the years, very fundamental to also things that I really like, very applied. At one point I had a group of like 20, 25 experimentalists under me and we were all working on different uh, methods of uh, magnetic, magnetic storage and advanced read heads. Um, I worked in strongly correlated electron materials, magnetic materials. And then one day around, I don't think, I don't know how exact this date is, but it was around then in 2005, my good colleague, Jamie Kaufman, came to me with an interesting challenge. They had a computer simulation of time-dependent viral evolution, but they weren't sure if they're reaching a steady state. Okay, now that seems like a, a, a one kind of question. But then he asked, could I help by doing thermodynamics on this system? And my first reaction was thermodynamics of an agent-based computer simulation? But why not? So eventually I figured out what he could mean and I derived equations representing the computer steps and was able to solve whether they had a steady state. And indeed, it turns out that I could prove that they had one and only one steady state. And then eventually, yeah, I did thermodynamics, an entropy partition function of thermodynamics too. And um, I was hooked. Uh, biophysics was for me. The, the math, the intuition, was far more than many of the black box methods for strongly correlated systems that I had been working on. And since then I've worn two hats. On one hand, still doing quantum, and I work on quantum computing right now for IBM. And the other is biophysics. And I still work on viral evolution and mutation. And of course, then when the pandemic hit, first I, at the APS March meeting, I had to search the index to find even one more talk on viruses before the pandemic and then of course, after the pandemic hit, there were a lot of talks in my area and I got tons of talks in this. And um, that kind of launched me in, in this career. And in the background, since I'd been working with Jamie, I'd been teaching myself biology. And as a kind of as a pointer to people who wanna completely change fields, I felt it took roughly 10 years to completely get comfortable with biology of viruses, cells, and so forth, and to understand conference talks and so forth. And right now I'm as comfortable with conferences in biophysics uh, than I am in the you know, strongly correlated materials. And I love working in both areas. So um, this is, I, I thought I, being at the end, I kind of suspected that things would be running late and I just stopped my talk right here. So we don't run way, way, way over. Maybe there'll be some time for questions. Thank you very much, Barbara. Do we have questions? Sri, I don't know how to tell if there are questions because it seems to go straight straight to you. Um, but I'll ask the question. Um, so Barbara, one of the things that has been different, obviously, between the two of us is you've been in industry you know, all this time and I've been at, at UC. And I'm just wondering if you have advice for, um, for sort of graduate students and young scientists 
um, and also for you know aging faculty members about how to give um, give students the best opportunities for industry careers um, when they get their PhDs. Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Yes. So the best way to uh, get an entree into industry is either the way I did where somebody recommended me, or the key thing is go to conferences where there are people from industry. The APS March meeting is not such a conference. Um, find what field you're interested, the student is interested in and maybe see if the student can go, if it's local, especially, and the costs are not too high, get the speaking as, as an advisor, helping a student, get the, see if the student can go to one of these conferences that have more an industrial presence. So in biophysics, you know, that's kind of the, the physics and the chemistry and the biology areas. And there are a number of conferences in these areas. The In chemistry, of course, um, the, the American Chemical Society meeting has a lot of industrial uh, particip participants in that. And there are also a lot of, of um, industrial sponsors of many of the bio conferences I go to. So the students should, should with maybe the advisor's help, find these various industrial people who work in areas of interest and uh, make an appointment to talk with them and find out what they do. So that networking, in other words, and it isn't as easy with industrial people because they tend to arrive at the day of their conference and then leave again. So they're not going to be around very long, many of them at the conference, but make contact them, make an appointment and to go talk to them. And then the other thing is to, to remind students that in industry, people are always eager to have smart people work on their own projects. And if you don't focus on doing the kind of research that you want to do, you can get sucked into doing this, that, something else for other people and always be kind of working as part of, now working part of teams is wonderful and that's part of industry. But you want to also lead some things sometimes, do the things you want to do and that you think is important. And that's something that needs, as a professor, of course, you can't survive unless you define research projects and get funding. And so that's not such the problem in, 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 in uh, academia. But in industry, it is important to decide what you're interested in and do those things in addition to working on teams. I'm sorry for such a long answer, but that's my thoughts on the matter. Well, that's that's so great. That's that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, did you find that IBM was receptive, has been just as receptive to the work on virus evolution as the work on, you know, quantum computing? Is that a significant effort? Um. The interest in it has waxed and waned over the years. There was a period of time when IBM had a burgeoning healthcare and life sciences area, and this fit in very nicely into that. And um, now it's it's kind of it swung a little bit the other way, but I still go to conferences anyway. And um, so I uh, uh, the answer is it's, it's it, it waxes and wanes over the years. It's 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 as as healthcare is or is not a, a key area. IBM's areas, of course, as we know, are AI, machine learning, security, uh, a hybrid cloud, um, things like this. And so that doesn't fit so easily into and quantum computing, of course, where I am now, and and um, uh, viruses. It, it don't fit as well right now, but that doesn't stop me from still working in that area because I like thank it. I love it. Thank you so much, Barbara. It's been really interesting to hear your story and uh, um, I'll pass it back to Sri.